Welcome to this webinar, which is provided by Vision Engineering Electronics Academy. My name is Bob Willis, and I'll be presenting and organizing today's webinar. Before we start talking about the, the topic of today, I'd first like to introduce you to the control panel, which you have on your screen at this moment in time. Now, the orange button allows you to reduce the size of the control panel. Um, by clicking on the blue button, you can increase the size of the image on your projection facility in your conference room or on your PC screen. If you have any questions, you can always type it directly into the control panel as indicated here by the red arrow. If you have any technical problems, please use one of the telephone numbers provided on your registration and reminder emails. You'll also need your ID number and access code, which is included on your email. It's not possible for myself, the presenter and organizer, to assist you during a live presentation. At the end of the presentation, we have a couple of survey questions. Really appreciate if you just take a couple of moments to give your feedback on the webinar, its content, and things you'd like to hear about in the future. A copy of the presentation material will be sent out by Vision Engineering uh, shortly after the webinar, and a video will be re available on the Vision Engineering website uh, after a few days. A little bit about my background. First of all, I've been involved in electronic manufacturing all of my working life. I've run my own training and consultancy business for the last 30 years, and I've been involved in both PCB fabrication and assembly both in contract manufacturing and OEM roles. And fortunately, I've had the opportunity of traveling around the world, presenting workshops and hands-on training sessions. And that's what I still do today. In addition, I do webinars like this on a regular basis, uh, both for the Academy and also uh, from my own website. Now, we're going to be talking about printed circuit board defects today, but first of all, let's sort of introduce the whole issue of printed circuit boards. Uh, well, if you want a good textbook on printed circuit board manufacture, there are a range available, and I've illustrated some of them on this slide. However, the best book is the printed circuit handbook written by Klein Coons, Jr., and it really is the Bible for all companies within the electronics industry. However, the other titles are very, very good as well. Another textbook, but also a standard or a reference source is something that you should be aware of if you're a fabricator, an assembler, or a design engineer. And this is the IPC 600, which is acceptability of printed circuit boards. And basically, you will be referencing this or another standard when you're procuring boards from your supplier. Now the standard illustrates certain aspects of the manufacturing process, but also the materials and also criteria for acceptance on all aspects of the printed circuit board. Now, one of the things I do emphasize is understand if you ever quote a standard or make reference to a standard in any documentation, make sure you understand what it says and what it means. The reason is so many people quote standards but never read the standards and that can obviously lead to confusion between yourself and the supplier. So assemblers and suppliers must understand and use the same terminology. In addition, I think it's very important that every company has a basic procurement specification or if not, a drawing which includes all the relevant information and this is obviously related to the materials, but also the specifics that you want on your printed circuit board. As an example, you will highlight the type of materials you're going to use, the plating thicknesses, the copper weights, whether there's any requirement for solder resist, legend, the type of surface finish you're going to be using, and most importantly, the class of board that you're procuring, i.e. with reference to the IPC 600. You'll also put in special requirements that might be specific to a particular product, and this should be reviewed periodically to make sure it's up to date and obviously covers every aspect. I also recommend that you sit down with your PCB manufacturer or PCB suppliers and make sure that you both understand what you require as a user to avoid any problems in the future. 
The build of materials is quite often specified by a combination of the supplier, designer, and obviously the assembly company. However, again, take reference from the PCB manufacturer because he may give you recommendations which might actually reduce the cost of your printed circuit board and hence benefit you as the user, but making sure you both understand what you're purchasing. I've worked for two companies just recently where there wasn't a specification and really there was no credible reason for rejection because there wasn't a specification. So please consider this in detail. Now, defects do occur, hopefully not as often as you might think with printed circuit boards. But IPC have a wall chart which illustrates some of the defects that may be found internally on the printed circuit board. And these are sort of things that are checked in terms of a quality control within a PCB manufacturer. And you might do your own tests on a board through microsectioning and other means to assess the quality initially of the board, or you might use it as an ongoing acceptance criteria. But it's a useful chart and it highlights some of the common terminology used within the industry. Now, what I want to do during our time together is have three questions or three polls. Uh, this gives you an understanding of who's on the webinar, but also the type of board problems, issues that companies have. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what class of printed circuit board do you procure from your supplier? So what's the most common standard you use? And what I'd like you to do is simply click the button to tell me what class is the majority of your boards purchased to. And I'll just allow 10 or 20 seconds for you all to participate. So we've got at least uh, 80 to 90% of people contributing to this survey. This is useful for reference uh, for yourselves at a later stage. Okay, we're over 90% now, so I'm going to stop the survey at that particular point and continue with the presentation. The results of the survey will also be provided to you uh, after the webinar. So let's look at what we can do to check the quality of a printed circuit board. Well, one of the things we can use internally is x-ray inspection. Now, if you have an x-ray facility, then it's a non-destructive test. And I just wanted to show you some examples. Now, here we've got poor plating or damage to the plating as seen on a plated through hole board. And the red arrows are indicating uh, rim voids, voids around the rim or the knee of the hole. And this can be caused by poor plating or poor preparation of the circuit board. It doesn't actually, in this particular case, lead to a failure of the product, but it's certainly something that impeded the soldering operation. Another example, in this particular case, one of my old boards, uh, we were producing boards with 0.2 millimeter holes, uh, both in standard board finish and up to four millimeters, and we had poor plating. And as you can see, indicated by the red arrow here, there is no plating in the hole. But this is easily picked up using x-ray inspection. So again, use the technique if you have it, because it is non-destructive, and you can capture the information and provide it to your supplier. Another thing you can do is do internal measurements. Now, most x-ray systems allow you to do this, and as you can see, I'm I'm measuring track dimensions, I'm measuring interconnection thicknesses. I can't measure plating thickness, but I can look at the quality of drilling and also the quality of the plating. You can obviously look at separation distances and dielectric spacing. So some fundamental things that we can do if we feel we have a problem with a batch or a problem with a particular circuit design. Now, with uh, blind wire holes, uh, blind wire holes are holes that either go from the top layer to an internal layer or buried wires, another term we use in the industry, where we've got a wire internally connecting two or multiple layers inside the board, which we don't actually see from the outside. Now, we can do micro sections and also we can use X ray to look at the wires. We can't really check the interconnection quality 
with x-ray we can't get the definition but I just illustrate what we can see if we're examining uh, microvirus in a printed circuit board now one of the things I like to do when I'm setting up or working with a PCB manufacturer that's had problems with via holes is uh, to do a mechanical test and what I illustrate here is the way in which you can simply look at a via and I've taken a board I've ground the surface of the board which allows me then to inspect the copper plating and also the interconnection between the copper plating and the capture pad within the board and what I'm showing you here is some high magnification views of the surface of the copper plating which is down the via hole the reason we have to lap or grind some of the sample is to actually get the depth of field to be able to look at this now of course we can do micro sectioning uh, but this is a simple test in manufacture in the in the, in the uh, fabrication process now when I have problems with blind vias and we have failures due to poor interconnection or possibly it's caused by high temperature causing board to expand and actually cause the via to fail one of the ways I like to use I can use micro sectioning to look at the vias but also what I can do is grind the PCB so in this example I'm taking an assembled board which has a known problem and I'm grinding up through the board lapping away the material to the back of the capture pad and you can see a photograph here on the right hand side of the back of the capture pad I then peel the track and the pad away from the surface of the laminate now if we have good quality plating which I've broken I fractured either in fact in the assembly process or I fractured during that test I would see evidence of a hard brittle fracture on the bottom of the via which I show on the left hand side or on the capture pad on the right in both these examples that is not present we can see evidence that we've plated but there's no rupture between the copper surfaces so it's not a brittle fracture that via was never made correctly to start off with so it may have passed electrical tests originally but then actually failed during the assembly process so in this particular case the via is the problem a board fabrication issue now another problem that we see uh, from time to time in PCB assembly is pad cratering and this started off uh, during the introduction of lead free technology when a lot of companies went to high uh, high TG materials or high temperature laminates and unfortunately some of the materials had very brittle epoxy the resin in it was very brittle so when you did drop testing or flexure of a printed circuit board or you had high expansion and contraction during reflow and cooling of large BGAs the pads were ripped out of the surface of the laminate they may not have electrically failed straight away but this is the result so consequently people looked at different laminate materials and also improving the adhesion of copper to the surface the problem with drop testing or vibration and shock is that with lead free the ball material is much harder mechanically much more rigid but that then transfers the energy the force into the board which then created the separation again quite often it's difficult to detect because you don't necessarily always get electrical failure this is a micro section and an SEM which shows pretty much the same fault so those are the couple of the reasons why you may get it the base material uh, not good adhesion between the copper and the epoxy resin flexure of the board drop testing or potentially expansion and contraction of the card now these are a couple of example photographs which show me testing samples where I'm removing the BGA from the surface of the board and you can see the difference in the visual appearance where we're separating the pad from the PCB we can see the glass strands we can see the epoxy resin still present on the pad and in a couple of cases uh, literally uh, no adhesion whatsoever another reason that we 
can see this and we have poorer adhesion of copper in a general in a general sense on a printed circuit board is as designers want faster and faster circuits they want thinner and thinner dielectric spacing between uh, tracking insulation then further tracking the actual needles in the copper are decreased so you find that some materials the actual adhesion promotion based on the copper topography is reduced so mechanically you don't get the same adhesion and certainly you would find this if you do uh, pull tests and peel tests on materials you'll find differences if you expose them to very high temperatures as we do with high temperature soldering um, again you might see poor adhesion characteristics and a couple of the ways uh, the designers have overcome this or reduced this possibility is the use of resist defined pads there are a number of reasons why we use this technique but that's one it does give some mechanical support to the pad during testing now surface finish tends to be a, a debate a discussion point quite often in the PCB industry there are lots of different surface finishes and there are specifications for some of them not all of them and one of the things that you must be aware of is the surface finish and what surface finished is the most appropriate for you now what I'd like to do now is just again ask you a question and this question relates to what is the most common issue you have with printed circuit boards the most common issue that you see on printed circuit boards so I'll launch the survey if you just like to select which you feel is the most common problem you have on printed circuit boards and I just take a few moments for you to add those to the survey again I'll wait until people are up to about 90% um, participation before we end the survey So we're up to 70%, just a, a few more to come in. Okay, that's excellent. That's over 90%. And as I said, we'll pass on the results of the survey uh, to you uh, after the webinar. So on to the subject, solder finish. It's up to you to specify which you think is most appropriate for your operation. Now, one of the things I think is particularly important to augment your own standards and augment the existing IPC material is to have some visual reference to what a good finish is. Now, here I show you silver and tin, and I show you at different magnifications. And this is the sort of information I'd like to suggest should be available uh, to goods in departments and also to your engineers on your stencil printing lines because they're the first ones that generally unpack the boards and put them onto the printer uh, either an automated process or a semi-automatic process so understanding visually what you would expect to see at uh, normal magnification and high magnification for all of the surface finishes helps because they are the first people to see the boards and they can highlight where there might be differences and you're seeing this early on so people can investigate and it's the same thing when you're looking at solder level boards again if you look at the finishes in the industry solder leveling and nickel gold generally speaking uh, don't give too many problems in terms of wettability and solderability whereas the other finishes do uh, tin is not ideal for double-sided reflow it's fine for single-sided reflow and possibly for wave and selective soldering OSP can work for single-sided reflow and selective soldering again it depends you're picking the material for your process and your manufacturing operation now in terms of issues and problems this is quite a common thing that I see on printed circuit boards and it may not have an electrical effect it may not actually have an impact but visually it's wrong and you should look out for it and this is what we call nickel foot where the nickel bath is actually overplated where it shouldn't be onto the laminate surface and on this particular example onto the resist as well the gold is then followed up and coated it as you can see and you get this outline around the original pad 
Now, potentially on some circuits, this could actually lead to a short circuit because you're decreasing the separation distance on the printed circuit board between pads. So in reflow, you could get a short. In some electrical requirement, in some electrical systems, you might well find that this reduction in insulation gap may affect the performance of your printed circuit board. So where you're seeing a high incidence of this, or certainly something as bad as the example on the bottom slide I show, or the bottom image I show, then you've got to query this with your PCB manufacturer. It is not an indicative of good quality board fabrication. Now adhesion of nickel gold uh, on a printed circuit board is a fairly an uncommon problem, uh, but occasionally you do see this. And this is where the gold is not actually adhering uh, to the nickel. And a simple test for picking this up is to do an adhesion test simply using sticky tape. Now the actual test method is covered in the IPC test methods manual. Um, the test methods, individual methods, actually can be downloaded free of charge from the IPC website. If you buy the whole manual, there's a cost involved. But it's a fairly simple test if you find you do have problems with separation. Now, this is an example of poor adhesion, and this is, again, fairly unusual, but this is actually poor adhesion that we saw on solder level boards. Normally with solder leveling, uh, you either get wetting or you don't get wetting. But on this particular case, uh, the board was solder leveled, and there was a very thin layer which adhered to the copper surface. But as you can see, when we actually undertook um, the, the tape test, we actually removed that thin layer of uh, solder coating from the surface. And unfortunately, on these batches of boards, it actually led to solder joint failure, as you see in the top two examples on this particular slide. This is just purely poor preparation or incorrect preparation uh, of the pads prior to the uh, coating process. Sometimes boards actually can be recovered, but not always. So it's something to look out for. Now, another issue that is not that common to see these days. However, I literally saw this just two months ago in an automotive manufacturer where they were using silver finish boards. Silver finish boards did suffer from a thing called champagne voiding a few years back where you saw multiple very small voids at the solder interface between the BGA termination and the pad. And literally, you've got hundreds of thousands of very small voids, which did affect the mechanical uh, adhesion of the solder joint to the pad, which did lead to some disrupted joints. In this particular occasion, uh, what was happening is you're actually getting outgassing from the surface of the pad during the soldering operation. So nothing to do with the profile or nothing to do actually with the solder paste, which is generally what we blame when we do get voiding. So something to be aware of, look out for, and you might hopefully not experience this. Now, another issue related to board finish, um, if you step back probably about five years ago, and we still see this today, is sulfur and sulfur corrosion. So where you've got a printed circuit board which has no protection either from the assembly or from conformal coating, uh, we can see sulfur corrosion. The top images on this slide show sulfur blooms. These are the black deposits on the surface of the tracks. On the x-ray image you see on the top right, you can see the track reduction. And I've basically done this x-ray prior to removing the black deposits. So you can see through and see how the track has been reduced. On the bottom left-hand view, I show where there is no connection between the track and the solder joint. And literally the corrosion has occurred on the surface of the board. This is predominantly or was predominantly seen uh, with boards which has a silver finish where the silver and the copper were exposed in conjunction with the atmosphere that caused this corrosion product. And I've seen it very, very severe in certain applications, but it's where actually there is sulfur actually in the environment or possibly in the product uh, that's being produced. So again, something to look out for. There are many very good technical papers on this particular subject. 
Now, one of the things about solderability is obviously there are standard tests in the industry, but my one concern is that we still use what I consider archaic tests to look at solderability and wettability. And although still covered in IPC standards, um, the rotary dip or solder float test, in my opinion, is really not representative of today's technology. So if we're talking about ultra fine pitch reflow technology, this archaic test really should be updated or replaced with much more appropriate testing. We'll come back to that in a moment. But there are two basic defects that we get during soldering, uh, surface non-wetting or de-wetting. Now, non-wetting is where the solder does not wet to the surface. So that's non-wetting. So you reflow solder, you wave solder, or you selective, and you get no evidence of solder adhering to the surface. An example of that I show here, where these boards have been through reflow soldering, you can see the solder has reflowed, but the solder has wet the terminations, but not the pads. So you can see in the bottom example where the solder paste has literally reflowed and balled up. Now, this example was not a quality problem with the PCB. It was an issue with the assembler. The assembler had gone through a wash-off process, i.e. he wasn't happy with the printing, and washed off the board, reprinted and reflowed. And that's perfectly feasible to do if you've assessed your process and you know you're not leaving any residues on the printed circuit board. So if you define your process, yes, you can do this, but you might want to check and see whether you've affected the wettability or solderability of the surface based on the materials or the methodology you're using. So this is classic example of non-wetting. Now, de-wetting is where solder wets the surface, however, if it remains in a liquid state or is then resoldered or you go through another reflow operation, it de-wets, it draws back from the original pad and the original area that it's wetted to. So de-wetting is shown with a couple of examples at the top of this slide. You can see on the top left hand corner um, on an SO lead where the solder is around the lead but not on the pad. And if you look very carefully, you can see the pad has a lot of scratches in it. They're not actually scratches. This is mechanical cleaning, which really is something we want to try and avoid on any pad surface and not standard in manufacture today. The top right example shows exactly the same thing. We can see a solder joint formed on a through hole, but you can just about make out some lines in the surface of the copper. And this is sometimes done to improve the adhesion of the solder mask to the board surface, but it will affect the long-term solderability. Now, the two videos I want to show you are classic examples of de-wetting. And this is one on the left-hand side where you can see a solder joint, and all I'm doing is reflowing the solder again. And you can see how the solder pulls back from the pad to the pin and it's de-wet from the surface much like the photograph you see top right on this slide. The second example, second video uh, clip, I'm just reflowing a through hole joint which is suffering from a thing we refer to as black tar and as you can see when I reflow the solder joint again the solder is de-wetting from the surface of the pad. So both of these examples uh, are related uh, to the board and the board finish um, and not necessarily related to the PCB manufacturing process. So a couple of examples. Uh, these two examples were taken on my Evo cam. Um, I use it for uh, inspection, obviously, of solder joints, but it's particularly useful for doing video clips like the two examples here. Uh, so it's an Evo cam. Now, if we look at wettability and solderability, I've got to give you two options uh, to what test you can actually do yourself. The first option is the expensive test, but it is the ultimate test of wettability and solderability and measuring uh, samples uh, to see what effect any of your processing has on that particular finish, whether we reflow it once, reflow it twice, reflow it in air, nitrogen, or whatever else. 
and the wetting balance is the industry standard it's a laboratory test not a shop floor test but it allows you to do direct measurements on the quality consistency of a surface finish and these two examples that I'm showing you here the board and the globule of solder have been wetted with flux and we're bringing them in contact with each other and you're actually measuring the wettability or solderability of the two surfaces and as you can see the one on the right hand side didn't wet anywhere near as fast as the one on the left hand side now if you're not familiar with wetting balance we're measuring the wetting force so what you're looking at here is a wetting force measurement the blip as the graph goes down to a negative figure is where we're making contact with the board with the solder globule so we're getting a lifting effect as the solder wets a sample the force changes and we're measuring the actual wetting force and you can see this is a typical curve you might expect to see the next two curves on this slide or three three curves in fact uh, show poor wetting um, you can see that we don't even get over the negative over the zero line so we're only just starting to wet after um, a number of seconds really we should wet within a second to three seconds there is specific criteria for different finishes however if you've not wet in four seconds there's something seriously wrong if you're conducting this test this equipment as I said is it is quite expensive uh, I use it all the time to do assessments because it's the only thing that gives you credible data however there is an alternative and the alternative that I use a lot in manufacture because it's something I can do on the shop floor very easily after it's been designed into the board and this is basically parallel tracks on a board so what I've got here is just a sample a multi board I've got tracks parallel tracks which I've incorporated into the design it could be on the scrap area it could be on the actual board and it allows me to assess a board very very easily based on previous information so basically what I do is I can measure the wettability or solderability of a board and compare batch to batch date codes and also what has happened during the assembly process so if I'm doing uh, double-sided I'm doing a delay between single-sided double-sided assembly whatever I'm doing I can look at the impact very very simply and this is what we call a, a wedding test so I'm showing you a video clip on the left hand side of solder dots solder paste dots which I've printed normal during normal printing and you can see all of the dots have coalesced together so there is no dots remaining in this second example this is again nickel gold but on this occasion you don't get the same number of dots coalesced together so the actual wettability of that sample has been affected in some way so let's say that example is your reference and all of your boards are always like that but you never actually get any defects on your actual product then there's your reference so if the number of dots that don't coalesce increases then you've got to look at why that's happened and also it gives you a simple test that somebody could do on a batch of boards where you don't like the color of the boards you don't like drying marks on the surface of the boards again you can do a simple test with no components on the waste area and see what impact that actually has it's simple test simple to incorporate onto any board design and this final example just shows us doing exactly the same test for the same parameters uh, with OSP copper so you don't get the same degree of wettability or solderability on this particular sample you can see there's a lot more dots that haven't coalesced together so the results of this test here you see a graph the low numbers so you've got a scale of 0 to 100 so the lower the number of non coalesced dots the better the performance but if you look at the first graph is convection reflow first side and then convection reflow second side you look at the difference and significant change in the tin finish boards so a lot of the other finishes uh, change but not to the same percentage degree so again 
Very, very simple, very, very cost effective way of assessing boards. Now, the third question I wanted to ask in our little survey is what surface finish do you most commonly use on your printed circuit boards in manufacture? So again, I'll launch the survey and give you a, a few moments to uh, tell me what finish you most commonly use on the majority of your products in manufacture. And as I said, we'll feed back all the data to you after the webinar. Okay, that was a, a much quicker response. Well, well done, guys. Uh, so we're over 90% of delegates uh, within a much shorter time frame. Well done. I'll close the survey there. Okay, now tin whiskers. Does it happen on boards with tin finish? Yes, it does. And this is an example of whiskers forming in plated through holes. Now, this is not necessarily uncommon, uh, or sorry, not common, but I have seen this on a number of occasions and I've highlighted it to customers on uh, tin finish boards. If the boards are produced correctly, stored correctly, then it shouldn't be an issue to you. But certainly it's of concern if you see this and particularly uh, if you're uh, using uh, working in a high reliability industry. But the fundamental way in the which the, tisk the whiskers form is covered in a very good technical paper which uh, was produced by MPL. And I'll give you details to how to download that a little bit later on. Now when you're doing quality control checks uh, or monitoring PCB fabrication, microsections is a very good technique. And normally speaking, you would do this with your supplier. Um, if you do microsections yourself, you should always make sure that you're going and cutting through the board to actually get to the center of the hole. That's how you make the most uh, consistent assessment of the boards and also be able to measure the plating thicknesses as well. Again, any board you look at, if you're visiting your PCB manufacturer when he's been doing microsections, this is what you want to see. Another thing is the photography. It's very important you're able to assess the quality of your boards or sample boards and unfortunately these are two examples of micro sections that were done for me. The first one on the left hand side doesn't really show me anything and certainly the photograph on the right hand side is absolutely atrocious. And these were on 0.2 millimeter wire holes after I'd done thermal cycling. So I wanted to see the effect of thermal cycling. So if I look on the left hand side I don't see any effect. But if the micro sections are done correctly and etched correctly, which I redid, you can see the effect. So both the same samples, but you can see clearly here there's some small amount of uh, cracking based on the thermal cycling I've put these boards through. Now these will not fail, but these are characteristic of what you might see if you're doing uh, some form of thermal cycle testing. You won't see a change in resistance based on this, but visually you want to see what has happened during your uh, environmental testing. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is look for good quality micro sections because that's how a PCB fabricator controls the quality of your product. Also, if you're doing failure analysis and looking for uh, failure, here's an example of inner layer failure, separation between one of the inner layers to the barrel of the hole, but also shows you resin on the surface of both that and also on the copper foil, which makes up the pad. And you can see the resin on the knee of the hole contaminating the surface. If we go to higher magnification, again, that's good because we can see this separation. Now, any time I see this type of failure uh, or we're questioning the quality of the board, what I always do is take that section and go and go through the board. Now, there's only half of the board left now, but at least I can look and see how and if the complete copper barrel is separated from the inner layer pad, as you can see in this particular case. So always use the information you have, the section you have, to gain more understanding of the seriousness of the problem. It's fairly simple to do, and it's standard practice, certainly for me. Uh, to do this sort of operation in fabrication. Now we're seeing a growing issue 
um, and it's not surprising, I guess, of failures due to some form of corrosive products. And dendrites, uh, copper dendrites, silver dendrites forming on the surface of printed circuit board assemblies. And this is really to do with a combination of the materials we're using, possibly, the environment we're putting a product into, and either non-use of conformal coating or poor use of conformal coating. Um, but inevitably, the more products we put outside in the environment, we're getting conden condensation take place, and even a small amount of corrosive material on the surface of the board or assembly can lead to dendrites. But where you get water literally condensing onto the surface, there is a perfect opportunity for dendrites to form. And these examples I show you in the photographs are just simple examples, optical and x-rays. They're all of the same failure inside a product which cause intermittency after a small amount of time in service. Now, if you've never seen dendrites form, basically a simple test you can do yourself. Take a printed circuit board, take two tracks, put a voltage across it, and put a droplet of deionized water. The water's pure. So that won't contribute to the problem. But if there is any ionizable material on the surface of the printed circuit board, it will form a short, a dendrite, between those two surfaces. And if you then put, let's say, 100 volts through it, you'll actually see it go pop. And it's quite revealing when it goes bang. Now, again, if you haven't seen that, this is a, one of my video clips uh, which just show dendrites forming. Now, this is an exaggeration because I've got a lot more moisture on the surface of the board. But this is the type of fern-like structure you can see forming on a printed circuit board. So if you ever have failures of a product where you've actually got a hole in the board or burn marks, quite often this is what happened prior to uh, the voltage passing across it and actually causing it to burn out and that's why it's happening. So look at cleanliness, consider what you're going to be doing in terms of conformal coating, control the contamination or a printed circuit board assembly through the whole of the manufacturing process. Now one of the ways in which we monitor cleanliness um, is unfortunately really a technique which is used for process control. It is not necessarily confirming the reliability of a circuit. It is a process control test which has been around for many years. We used to use this to control our cleaning process to see when we needed to change our cleaning process rather than to check reliability of the circuit. But within the standards, uh, we've seen for many years that 1.5, 1.2 micrograms per centimeter squared is quoted as an acceptable cleanliness level. But really, the test was originally designed for monitoring a process to see process change and fluctuation. It's still used for quality assessment, um, but bear in mind that you could still have potential failures, uh, even at the levels that are included in the standards. It's becoming more common now for PCB fabricators to be asked to look at total cleanliness on a board, or we look at cleanliness around certain areas of components. And ion chromatography, we're using a fluid, we're introducing it to the whole circuit board or part of a circuit board and then measuring and determining all of the contamination and actually quantifying that. There is IPC standards which define how to do the test, how the system works, etc. And I've actually shown you an example of a test board of mine where we're actually defining the area we want to test. So those little metal rings that I've placed around a QFP, a couple of BGAs, etc. I introduce test fluid to that area. I hold it in place for a period of time in line with the specification. I then take a sample out of that uh, little cup around the component and then I can assess what actual contamination is around the components. It's another technique which helps you understand the reliability of a circuit perhaps far more accurately because we know the type of contamination which is there. And also we can link it directly to SIR testing, surface insulation resistance testing, uh, on different parts on a printed circuit board. Now another failure mode that uh, we are starting to see more evidence of, and we've done quite a lot of work on this at MPL, is CAF, which is conductive anodic filamentation, I call it, 
Uh, other people call it a slightly different terminology, but I've always called it filamentation. And what we're getting is short circuits forming between adjacent through hole plated vias or through holes depending on the separation distance and the power and other aspects. And these two examples here, we've got backlight showing uh, an area where we're getting shorting or low resistance paths between two uh, through hole terminations. If I go at slightly higher magnification, uh, you can actually see the black area between the two connection points. And what is happening here, a combination of moisture in the printed circuit board and any residual contamination is tracking along the glass bundle. So if we get separation or poor adhesion of the epoxy resin to the glass, there literally is a gap. And in that gap, we can form a path, which is a low resistance path. And if you're working at high voltages, then you can actually get blowout of the circuit. Now, Ling at MPL, one of my colleagues there, uh, has done a nice video clip, which actually illustrates uh, this actually happening on a test circuit. So you've got parallel uh, vias, and using uh, special photography, we're able to show the impact of uh, applying a voltage between those two surfaces. So what you're actually seeing is that conductive path the temperature on it rise and of course potentially uh, blow out. So there's a lot of information on CAF in IPC documents and again it's something to look out for as you get more smaller and smaller on your boards or you raise the number of uh, interconnections and decrease the density or increase the, uh, uh, or s decrease the, the separation distance between those through holes. Now if you look at uh, solder joint failures uh, nickel gold, um, we've highlighted a number of times um, where we get black pad phenomena. But uh, we can get two failure modes, black pad where the solder does not wet the nickel, or we can get a thing called black tar, which is contamination, which is forming on the surface of the nickel, so we get de-wetting take place. Now, I'll, I'll pick up on both of those. But first of all, this is a classic example of poor quality boards. The solder joint is just not adhering. Visually, before any mechanical strain comes in, this would be a perfectly visual joint. So AOI would pass this, optical inspection probably would pass it. But mechanically, there's no joint there. The reason being that solder reflows across the surface, it dissolves the gold into the bulk of the solder, and, and because it's wet across and formed a joint, there may not be adhesion between the solder and the nickel. And this is the reason we get weak joints that look visually good before we put any mechanical strain on them. Now, one of the things you can do if you have a problem is look at the quality of the plating, of course. But also what we can do is look at higher and higher magnification of the gold and nickel surfaces and possibly strip off the gold just to look at the nickel which we're doing on this particular occasion. And as we get closer and closer, uh, we can see the structure of the nickel, and these are the nickel nobules on the surface of a pad, and we can see around them some level of attack on the surface. Again, most PCB manufacturers have got extremely good control of their plating bath these days, but it's certainly a problem that still exists randomly within the industry. This is what we call black tar, and the black tar term was coined by a good friend of mine, Dennis Price, who's now retired myself, just purely because we didn't want to confuse people with the two different things, black pad and black tar. Black tar visually looks like a, a black substance on the surface of nickel. It is still the nickel surface that uh, hasn't wet with solder, but it just has a different texture. And one of the video clips I showed you previously of de-wetting is exactly the same as this. It's literally the solder forms forms uh, across the surface of the gold, wets the gold, dissolves the gold, then pulls back and de-wets. And that's what you were looking at when I was showing you the de-wetting. A couple of examples on the left-hand side uh, show this phenomena, and it really is control of the nickel plating process, which is the culprit here. 
the x-ray examples on the right hand side were purely to show you show in this investigation I was conducting that we actually had very good wetting uh, in the barrel of the hole but it was mostly associated with the knee of the hole and the pad where this phenomenon was being seen the barrel of the hole and the strength of the solder joints in terms of pull-off strength were extremely high so although cosmetically it didn't look very attractive mechanically the printed circuit board would have met the requirements of the product now through hole pull away is something we don't tend to see much today original during the introduction of lead free technology we did because perhaps there wasn't as and much investigation or many trials conducted on good adhesion of copper to some of the high temperature laminates as I mentioned earlier uh, the epoxy resin systems were much harder so consequently the preparation the prep prior to electroless copper and electroplating uh, just didn't get the adhesion characteristics so in the early days of lead free we saw quite a bit of this today generally speaking we only see this where we've exposed the boards to too high a soldering operation too long a period in that soldering operation or we haven't got control of the soldering process we're using and with more and more people using contact soldering robotic soldering and laser soldering um, you really need to investigate uh, to see and minimize the possibility of this type of defect occurring now hopefully none of you experience this anymore but again I, I mention it for completeness copper erosion now during selective soldering or wave soldering with lead free alloys uh, particularly uh, tin silver copper uh, you can dissolve all the copper from the pads but it's all about temperature time and flow rate so where you've got high temperature long period of time or high flow rate of solder across the surface you can literally strip 10 to 20 microns off of a plated through hole in this example you can see where we've literally pretty much taken all the pads off of the board you see in the top examples here um, so certain solders are more susceptible but if you think about time temperature and flow rate those are crucial things but also follow recommendations in terms of copper plating thickness I have seen this in time to for time to time where boards have been through salt leveling and been double dipped which is something that really shouldn't happen today in PCB fabrication it was in the early days where people had problems of salt leveling high mass boards with a lead free alloy but that has been improved significantly so you shouldn't see that today but double dipping obviously the more you dip the more they expose a board to a solder, solder uh, bath, the more likely it is to dissolve more copper. It's fundamental. That's how we make solder joints. Now, outgassing and pinholing or blowholing in printed circuit boards is still something we see. And one of the questions to me on this webinar was about this particular defect. Well, bottom line is boards do have moisture in and they can outgas. If the plating in the plated through holes is sound uh, you have 25 to 30 microns of copper and there is no breaks or voids in that you should have a sound printed circuit board and boards should not outgas simple way of seeing whether it's a board problem is take a board that you've got a solder joint which you've actually got uh, outgassing on or pinholes and blowholes on touch it with a soldering iron as I show in this uh, illustration and if during that reheat of the solder joint you see lots of uh, solder being ejected from the solder joint as you see in this illustration or lots of bubbles and the solder continually moving um, then that's more likely to be uh, outgassing from the printed circuit board it's not contamination it's not flux left in the hole it's outgassing from the board however if you want to go a step further you can take a printed circuit board a bare board from the same batch and then put some high temperature oil into the plated through hole and again apply a soldering iron to the pad and watch outgassing taking place the oil is there to show the water vapor or the bubbles coming up through the oil that's why it's there if you go to my YouTube channel you can look at a longer version of these videos and also a more of an explanation on how to test your boards but this outgassing test you know I've been using for nearly 40 years 
It's still relevant today, still works, and very simple to conduct. Now, outgassing of printed circuit boards can also be an issue for us guys using LGA QFN type packages. And what I wanted to show you this is an example of gassing from via holes. Now, what I've done is I've put some oil on the t to the surface of the printed circuit board and video what's happening. So you imagine that underneath your QFN LGA packages. A lot of people blame the paste, the profile, but in this particular case, it's outgassing from the vias. So what you've got to do to investigate if there's some other reason for this particular problem. And I was working uh, at a company where I did this test and I was employed to look at printing and reflow, but it, the boards were the problem. And in this particular case, it really was the design which is the issue in the first place. But look at, find out what is actually causing the problem. Just step through the process and try and break it down to simple, manageable steps and try and simulate what's actually happening in the process, which I've done here. Now, delamination is something, again, I like to investigate very, very simply. If I have delaminated boards, which I illustrate on the left-hand side, all I do is take a knife and I cut out the blister. I cut out a section of the board. The reason being, it's quick to do. It's two or three minutes on the shop floor. And what I should expect to see is perfect adhesion of epoxy to copper, not as I show on the example on the right-hand side, where you can see some areas of the copper have no adhesion whatsoever. That indicates to me there's not been a proper bond there. So yes, the moisture in the printed circuit board has caused the board to expand and delaminate, but it was actually caused by voids inside the board which allowed the moisture to accumulate at one particular area. Using this investigative technique is simple, cheap, and again, quicker than microsectioning, and in my opinion, shows you a lot more information. Same basic failure is shown here with via holes. You can see these vias have popped around the solder mask. And what has actually happened in this example, pretty much the same thing. However, visually it looks slightly different. So basically I did exactly the same thing. I cut out the sample just with a knife on the shop floor. And if you look at the surface of the copper on the left hand side, there's no adhesion. So the vias have broken and separated so you would get an intermittent circuit, but the root cause is poor adhesion to that copper inner layer surface. So in terms of storage, control, and baking of printed circuit boards, I would draw your attention to IPC 1601. And we need to take better control of printed circuit boards, store them correctly, as recommended by our PCB manufacturer, but also consider the type of packaging. And if your boards are of very high value, consider much better packaging material. Standard vacuum packs is not really appropriate for most operations. So again, you've got to decide on what's appropriate for you. So refer to the standard. It breaks down what you should do. It gives you references for baking times and temperatures within the standard, but also use my simple to conduct solderability wetting test to see the impact of any baking process you implement, because then you can trace it back to the yield in your process as well, rather than just following a standard, which is good, however, understand what the standard really means. So baking of printed circuit boards, never ever do it unless you understand why you're doing it. And if you do it once to overcome a problem, don't continue to do it forevermore, which is what a lot of companies do. It's standard practice, but why? Why did you do it to start off with? Do you really need to do it on every batch of boards you actually are going to be assembling? Now, I've mentioned on a couple of occasions the NPL defect database, and you can download any of our NPL reports. They're free of charge, and they cover many of the subjects I've been talking about uh, with you on this webinar. And all you need to do is visit the website. I've given you the link there, so when you get the slides, you can visit or do a search and download any of the reports that you feel are of interest to you. The defect database also helps you solve problems or helps your operators solve problems by selecting alloy, type of defect, type of production problem. And if you do that, do a search, 
you'll be shown a lot of pretty pictures. If you find a picture which relates to the problem you're actually seeing in manufacture, that's fine. Then select that and that will give you the type of problem, the reason for it, and hopefully some corrective action. If we take an example, if we're looking for cracked conformal coating, here's an example. We click on the button, we've got the information, we click on the picture, it can go full screen, and then you can print that out with the information and pass it on to your colleagues. Again, a useful reference, again, it's free of charge for you to use in manufacture. So what I've tried to do uh, together over 60 minutes, and we'll just have some time for questions as well, is cover some of the defects we see in PCB manufacture on a regular basis, uh, some that are not necessarily always there, but uh, most of the ones that are most common. Uh, you can obviously visit my website, you can visit my YouTube channel to see Defect of the Month, which we put out every month with IPC and MPL. Uh, which is useful again for perhaps use in your training facilities. So what I'd like to do is uh, just pick up on any questions that you actually have. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in online, uh, but I also have some questions that were already posed to me, and I'll quickly go through those. Uh, first question that's actually been posed this evening, if you could please suggest how to qualify a PCB contract manufacturer, a PC PC contract manufacturer. I, Dan, I can't really do that on this particular event because we're talking about PCB fabrication, not contract. But what I'll do is I'll pick your email out of the contacts and send you a sheet on that. Uh, other than much uh, too much solder paste, what causes solder balls? Well, it depends where you're talking about. If solder balls, and we've got to differentiate here, if you're talking about little solder balls by the side of chip resistors, chip components, um, and other packages, they're referred to as solder beads. And basically, you have put solder paste underneath the package away from the wettable termination. If you go to and look up solder beads, solder beads on my YouTube channel, you'll see video clips showing solder beads forming and the root cause of that particular problem. But also, uh, Raymond, what I'll do is I'll send you a, um, a, a sheet about solder beads. Uh, what camera did you recommend for close-up micro images and videos you've shown? Um, well, the camera I've been using recently is an Evo cam. Um, and I don't mean to advertise, but it is, in fact, a, a vision engineering product that I've been using uh, at exhibitions because it's nice and compact. It's got its own built-in light source. There are obviously lots of equipment out there, and you've got to decide what you actually want. Uh, when I'm doing video simulation, uh, I use a Sony camera. Um, when I'm doing X-ray simulation, which I now do quite a bit, um, we've got a, a, a special box that we put in an X-ray system, and we can actually reflow uh, products to look at uh, what's actually happening underneath packages. So there's lots of different ways of doing video simulation. Um, and I find it incredibly useful, but you know what? Most companies have got a video simulator on their shop floor. It's called a rework station. If you've got a rework station and a video camera, you've got all the tools you need to take little bits of video and see what's happening because obviously your rework system is simulating your reflow process. So you've got all the tools you really need. Uh, Alternatively, buy yourself a high-def camera. You're probably looking at $200, $300, or you could buy a second-hand one uh, with a close-up lens. Work very, very well. Okay, so those are the questions that I've got coming this evening. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on some of the points that were asked of me uh, on the uh, uh, while you were booking. Uh, flux below LGA components. Now, some of these are not questions, really, but I'll try and allude to them. You will always get flux under QFN and LGA packages. If you want to clean, you have to evaluate your process capability for that cleaning process. You have to optimize your design, and you have to make sure the flux you're using in your solder paste is compatible with the cleaning process. If you do not do that, you'll get residues which do not dissolve. You'll get white residue still on the printed circuit board. You have to evaluate the three things together. 
Uh, solder, solder blow holes, I've mentioned, so hopefully that helps out uh, one of the engineers. I wasn't sure what profiling and mask vias means, but if we're talking about vias underneath LGA QFNs, I normally use open vias and I put a vias, I put a resist around the vias only, I don't cap it or fill it. Soldering of flexibles, um, it's not really the webinar for this particular subject, but if you do a search online for uh, Joe Felstad, Joe Felstad uh, flexible circuit assembly book, you can download that free of charge. Um, and if you look in the assembly section, somebody called Bob Willis wrote that section. So it's all about flexibles and flexible assembly. And the number one tip about soldering flexibles, use a pallet use a pallet. That is how you screen print, place, reflow, rework, and that would just work really nicely for you. Um, uh, proper, I've just, I've just got to go through what I can answer. Proper pay storage. Well, there's lots of pace out there in the marketplace that you don't really have to worry about. Uh, there's products on the marketplace you don't have to put in a fridge anymore. Um, I've got two or three tubs of material I'm using at the moment. They sit in my office. I use them. I come back to them. I reuse them, uh, and they're not stored in any special way. I really don't have a problem. So a lot of the materials today are really compatible uh, with open time. So again, investigate that. If you've got uh, problems of solder joints, send me a few photographs, and then I may be able to point you in the right direction there. Depaneling and removing of rails. If ever you have a board which is either a breakout uh, tabs or you're using V scores, please buy yourself a proper depaneling system. Do not break it out over a desk. Do not use a pair of tweezers, a pair of bolt cutters. You know, please, because you are potentially damaging the printed circuit board and the solder joints. So wherever you're depaneling, if your designers put in depaneling into your process uh, or into a contracting process, make sure they have proper tools to do it reliably. I, I spent too many years investigating failed components for this reason. Um, 0402, problems of soldering. Number one reason, the pads are the wrong size or wrong position. Generally, every time I investigate this, uh, and 0402s uh, tend to be more problematic than others. Also, look at reducing the paste volume you're using. So pads first, that's the crucial thing, to minimize movement of the component. And then paste volume, that will decrease the strength that's using to lift the packages. If you get uh, lifting of components specifically on reflow with nitrogen, then turn the nitrogen down. Use a higher air content. That will slow down wetting and decrease the likelihood of components moving during reflow. Uh, another question here on cleaning of printed circuit boards and issues under, with flux under components. It is a reality with reflow, be it chip resistors, chip capacitors, SOs, BGAs, you will get flux underneath the package. If that flux is going to affect the performance of the component or the performance of the circuit, you need to look at cleaning. You know, there's, there's not necessarily a substitute for that. But you must make sure you evaluate the process correctly to make sure you clean properly. Poor cleaning is worse than no cleaning at all. So you need to evaluate your process. Again, there's some guidelines on how to do that if you're interested. Um, Non-wetting or fully wetting of uh, boards with heavy ground planes, well, look at modifying the modifying the method of interconnection between the inner layer and the ground plane. Decrease the amount of copper making contact. Increase the hole or the uh, separation between the pad inside the board and the earth plane. Those things will decrease the heat loss during the soldering operation. But if you cannot do that, then you've got to investigate preheating the board assembly to get the board, the bulk of the board, up in temperature, that will then make it easier for selective soldering and hand soldering. It's a bit more difficult to do, but if you've got small batches of it, and that's what you've got to overcome, poor design, then that's really the only solution. 
if you put more and more heat into the board, you'll damage the board and then you'll have other problems. Okay, so that's, uh, I've already answered the question at the bottom there um, prior to uh, this uh, webinar because uh, the gentleman sent me a couple of pictures. Two other emails came in. Uh, what is done to prevent calf shorts? Okay, it's, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, work with your PCB manufacturer to maximize separation distances between any vias uh, plated through holes which are very closely spaced. Next thing is stagger them. When you, when you make a printed circuit board, you'll know that the fiberglass goes from north to south, east to west, so the actual glass strand bundle in a board. So what you do is you offset by 45 degrees, you offset your vias. So the two vias or two holes are not on directly in line on uh, a, a layer of glass or strands of glass. If you offset them, a calf has to go up one layer and then across. So it, it increases the, the, uh, the reliability of the circuit considerably. Again, if you go to the MPL website, do a search for CAF reports, that's all covered in there on the design criteria. A question uh, from Anne-Marie, uh, same person. Uh, in your opinion, what resin prepreg is best to use with high temperature environment PCBs? Is higher resin content better? Or Okay. Um, what I can do is send you a report that I did um, recently using high temperature materials and you can see the results of some of our soldering performance. Uh, hopefully that will sort of uh, fill in and answer the question uh, for you. So I've come to the end of my time. Um, so we have uh, just 10 minutes over the 60 minutes uh, allocated to me. So I apologize for taking up uh, your valuable time. Hopefully what I've tried to do is cover a number of different subjects obviously cover quite a few questions and uh, I'll send individuals some of the material that I've mentioned. Uh, thank you very much for attending this uh, vision engineering uh, webinar. Hopefully you found it useful. Uh, I hope that uh, we'll be presenting more webinars in the not too distant future. So once again, thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon wherever you are in the world. Good afternoon.